Today we have an award-winning um, graphic novelist, educator, and computer scientist, uh, Jean Luen Yang. Welcome to being here, or welcome here. Well, it's thank you for having me, yeah. Regina. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. Um, this is our first ever like video recorded show, so this is going to be um, great, and it's going to be perfect. It's going to be amazing. Right, it's going to be perfect because every time you do something to start, it should be perfect. Or you, absolutely, you otherwise, up. or you don't do it again. It, ev never yes, again. We're never going to do works. it again. <laughs> yes, that, that's exactly how science and education works. Yes. Um, this is all sarcasm, please, for our <laughs> for our watchers and listeners. Um, this past January, the Library of Congress um, nominated you for the fifth, um, I'm going to get this right, the fifth National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. And it's a two-year appointment, right? Yes. And we're going to come back to like what that means. Okay. Um, but it's, it's a big deal, though. It was a crazy thing. Yeah. I got to fly out to Washington, D.C. with my wife. Yeah. Super fancy, all these fancy people in a room. They gave me a fancy medal. It was amazing. And did like Obama pick you, President no, Obama, or that, was it? I was disappointed. Right? I was disappointed You're like, when where I found is that he? Out. But it was almost as good. It was, right. the, it was the librarian of Congress. Right. So at the time, it was uh, a guy named David Mao. And then there was a, a crew of folks from uh, the Children's Book Council. The previous uh, national ambassador was also on that. Okay. So awesome. they know President Obama. So by yeah, one somebody degree. There, somebody there has had a meal with President Obama. <laughs> right, right. So um, you're also the current writer for, for Superman I am. on DC Comics, yes. which is amazing. And like, I'm geeking out right now. And um, your first ever, um, where you were the writer on, the, on uh, issue 41, which I have here. Wow, well, thank you yeah. for having it. No, well, the um, Comics Place here in Bellingham, they just gave it to me because they're super nice. Because oh, they didn't cool. have any of your other books, and I was kind okay. of sad. So they gave me this. Um, so we're going to come back to being a writer for Superman. Um, so, again, welcome to being thank here. Thank you. First ever video. It's going to be great. <laughs> um, but like I said before, you kind of... Um, know a lot of well i shouldn't say a lot about science that maybe that's uh, insulting you know, but, <laughs> i don't you, know that much about you, science but but for i was for, like a b b minus student when i was going so, through college so was i now mm. phd that's what happened that's awesome <laughs> but um you know something about stem and you want to promote stem in your new position yes. right okay yes that's part of that's part of the platform right and we're going to come for back sure. i i really like you're saying that every ambassador has had this pot platform and that's part of yours this this yes. for this next two years so we're going to come back to that but before we do that uh, we always talk about on our podcast and now on our our show here we talk about background and we okay. talk about like the first thing we want to talk about is like how did you get into to stem because i know that you did major in computer um science right uh -huh. or was it computer engineering it was it was computer i think it was you know i don't remember the exact title <laughs> it's all right i think it was computer engineering it, it changes up I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you did ma um, major in some sort of STEM, and I'm, I keep on saying STEM, so for our listeners and for our watchers, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. That's right. Right. So it's a words, um, you know, us in the business use. Um, but I do also want to talk about your first, your first two, or your, let's talk about your first one, your first graphic novel. And it really does talk about the Asian American experience. So I want to talk about these two things. So, sure. so whatever you'd like to start with, want okay. to talk about computer science and your like, you know, spark how you got into that, or maybe talk about this. Well, I, I actually got into computer science and comics when I was in fifth grade. Oh fifth wow! Grade was a big year for me. You know, looking back, <laughs> it was an eventful year. It absolutely was. It absolutely was. So in in fifth grade, uh, my mom bought me my first comic book. Oh, okay. When I was a kid at local comic, actually at local bookstores, they had these things called spinner racks. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I don't think anyone under the age of thirty remembers that. Right. But there I am these over thirty. You got me. There are these wireframe uh, racks that would carry a month's worth of comics. Right. And then you could spin them so that you could see them all. Yeah. Uh, and, and one night, my mom took me to our local bookstore. I saw this issue of uh, Marvel 2-in-1. Okay. It was, starring, it was starring The Thing and Rom the Space Knight. So as soon as I saw it, yeah. I just knew I needed to own it. Right. Uh, and, and I brought it up to mom. I said, Mom, will you please buy this for me? She refused to buy it for me because she thought the thing looked way too scary. Yeah. Instead, she bought me the You're latest. You're afraid, though. I know. I, I, I have to be honest, though. Like, if I look back, I was kind of a wimp, well, especially no. when it came to monsters. So no. she had a point. Right. Okay. She definitely had a point. She made me. She knew you. She made me put that back, and she bought me the latest Superman comic, okay. which was like a, it was like a DC Comics Presents, I don't know, I think it was in the 50s, 
Okay. It had it had Superman and the Atomic Knights in it. So that okay. was the very first comic I, I bought. I like and, how she's uh, like, Marvel, no, here's DC. Yeah, it's because of Superman, <laughs> right, right? right? Like, she wouldn't have bought me Batman either. It's just because oh, Superman is such a Boy Scout. He is. Yeah. He is. But he, he does have depth, and we're going to get back he to does. that when you, because you're the writer now. I so agree, you know. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Actually, you know, when I was in fifth grade, I was not a big Superman fan. <laughs> So, you, you, so fifth you're reading, grade, fifth grade, started buying comics. Yeah. I also started making comics. I had this friend named Jeremy Kaniyoshi when I was in fifth grade, okay. and we started making comics together. So do we brainstorm stories. I do. We we like we lost touch, <laughs> and then we reconnected through the magic of Facebook. Okay. The magic so uh, of Facebook. so I, we just hung out. He lives in Hawaii. Okay. Uh, a couple years ago, we went out and hung out with him. It was fun. Oh no, you have to go to Hawaii. Super sad. I, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> sad to go to Hawaii. Right. <laughs> so so you're friends with. Um, his name one more time. Jeremy. Okay, Jeremy, and and you both like love comics. We both loved comics. Yeah. I was a, I was a new comic book reader. He'd been reading for a really long time. Um, in fifth grade. In fifth grade. He, he was start, like when I was like, two. Was, exactly. <laughs> like when he learned how to read, that was the first thing he did. Was he started wow. buying comics. His mom was. Um, cool. Super. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, my parents were not so cool with me right, reading me comics. Neither. It took me a long time to. To, to get them to turn around. Right. Uh, right. So that, that's how I got into comics, fifth right. grade. Uh, that same year during the summer, uh, between fifth and sixth grade, I took my first coding class. I took it as a summer enrichment class. It oh, was, cool. It was. Um, was it at a university or something? No, or? no. It wow. was. Well, this was the Silicon Valley. Oh. Right? Okay. So I think it was like somebody's mom was a programmer and she wanted to teach oh, her cool. kid and all of his friends. You, you can't walk us down the street without falling into somebody who's. Like yeah, a program. yeah, okay. yeah. The whole—it's just the computer town. Right. Uh, so I learned. Uh, I learned logo. Do you know what that is? Uh, n it sounds super familiar, but tell okay. me what logo. It's is. a. It's a language that was created specifically for education. It was created by uh, this guy named Seymour Papert. That and, sounds uh, awesome. And uh, do you know Seymour Papert? No, he's, just a, there's it's like an a awesome cult. name. There's a little cult around Seymour Papert because he's is it, such is a Is it like deal. the Tesla cult, like the Nikola Tesla? Or a little it's, bit. A little really? Bit like wow. That. I, I don't think it's as big, okay. but I'm trying to grow it. <laughs> He's amazing. This dude is amazing. He um, he okay. was he was really into computers. He was also really into education. So he uh, he created this uh, theory called constructionism okay. about how you should teach kids. Okay. Uh, and and then he created this language. He created it with a team. There's there's this other guy named Wally Furzig, I think you pronounce his last name. And what year and was Cynthia this about? Solomon. This was like '60s, I think. Okay. So the the whole point of the the reason why logo is awesome is that there's this little turtle. Okay. Right, and and it looks like a triangle because it was the '80s, and you just can draw a turtle with the, the graphics right. that had back then. But what you would do with logos, you would give this turtle commands, mm -hmm. and it would just go around the screen and draw stuff. That is know? the coolest thing ever. It is. It was amazing because right. I was always into art, right? So, right. So what that computer programming class was all about was making art. It was about making art right. by coding. I do like your your thing about logo. This this idea of this little thing that was like a turtle mm -hmm. was that the origin of your no. love for turtles? No, I, I, turtles <laughs> just keep showing up, but they're totally unrelated. That's weird, though. Yeah, it's a little weird. It's a little yeah. weird that it keeps coming back. The the whole turtle thing actually. Um, so just to reference for our viewers and our listeners, what I'm referencing is uh, the Shadow Hero, which is. This wonderful book. This is the first thing I read a oh, couple cool. days ago, Thank and you. I was just like, "This is amazing!" And it's um, the first Asian American superhero called the Green Turtle, and it was just a great story. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. no. Okay, well, I the Green it. Turtle is not my invention, right? Right. So he's a, he's it's, this but this old is your reinterpretation. Character. Yeah, yeah. It's Sunny and I yeah. bringing back this old character that nobody remembers. Yeah, I, I for yeah. Sure. Well, well. Yeah. So, so do you want to tell us? Maybe we can go back to this idea of how you kind of maybe growing up and we can come back to the the green turtle and this this book because i really like this story and i could identify with definitely both of these stories okay. so so maybe let's just start with the green turtle um so you said that this is this is a comic or derived from a comic from the 1940s yes. right you can tell us a little bit about sure that. sure uh in the 1940s there's this cartoonist his name was chu hing one of the first asian americans to work in the American comic book industry. Right. And the 1940s, like we call that the golden age of comics right. because that was when uh, comic books, especially superhero comics, right. first became like this mass medium, right? right? And people were getting crazy rich off of it. Like right. there, was, uh, there was, Superman debuted around that time, Batman debuted around that time. There were these international sensations. Uh, there was also like uh, Captain Marvel, Shazam was also right. around that time. Yeah. And, and it's hard to believe now, but back then he was actually on the same level as Superman. You know, right. he was well, if, just as popular. If you watch Batman Brave and the Bold now, which is uh -huh. an animated series, he's in that. Yeah, yeah. And he's, he's also he's in Young in Justice, that. is he? I don't remember, but yeah. yeah. 
I yeah, think he's cool. I, I love him. I think he's I think he's like he's like a total fantasy character. In any yeah. case, go, golden age of of uh, American superhero comics, and and all these publishers were just popping up and throwing characters out at the public. Yeah. Because people wanted to find the next Batman or right. Superman. So this right. was the environment that it was in, right? And right. and Chu Hing, this Chinese American. Uh, Cartoonist was working for this really small company called Rural Home that only lasted a couple of years. Right. Rural Home asked him to create a, a character, like a superhero character. So yeah. he does. He creates the Green Turtle. The rumor about the Green Turtle is that Chu wanted him to be a Chinese American, like right. he himself was. I love that story in the but back. But his, his publishers wouldn't let him do it. Right. It's 1944. Yeah, yeah. They just didn't think it would sell. Well, you know? they're having problems now, right, with making yeah, Superman Afro-Latino, yeah. you know, yeah. and... Anyway, continue. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's 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 kind of weird, right? We're like we're like almost a, a like decade, seventy like a, a, years like, later, yeah, and it's and still it's a still, problem. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. And anyways, <laughs> in any case, so yeah. so his publishers wouldn't let him do it. Chu reacts in this really passive aggressive way. Yeah, I love it. So I want to show this picture he is to everyone. A cartoonist, and that's yeah. What we do. So here's a picture. I don't know if, if we can get that. Like zoom in. I don't know. Where's the zoom camera? I don't know how to do this. But there it is. right here, and you you say that they, he never draws. Here's the green turtle right here. He never draws the green green turtle face on. Like you can never see his face really. Yeah, which yeah. Which is crazy. So so people can still believe maybe that he's Asian. Exactly. I so love it. that that's the theory. Yeah. That's the theory. Because when yeah. you look at the pages, you just don't see superhero comics drawn like that, right? right. Where you only see the character's back. Or right. if he's turned towards you, like something's covering his face. Right. You know, and, and not and just the mask, but like yeah, a shadow. Yeah, like a shadow yeah. or like his arm, like he'll be punching and his arm will be in the way. <laughs> and and the rumor is that he did it because he wanted to be able to imagine his character as he intended as an Asian American. Right. We don't know if that's true. Like the Green Turtle only lasts five issues. Right. Uh, he's the lead feature in Blazing Comics. Okay. Which you can get for super cheap at, at comic book conventions. I got right. all five issues. All five issues. Yeah, and they were all under like, 50 bucks. It was crazy. For <gasps> comics that old, it's kind of crazy. It, yeah, that is crazy. Yeah. So we, we have to take a break, but when we come back, I want to talk about the the reimagining of the story and kind of like how the parents are portrayed and also kind of the linking between not being a perfect Asian American, which is definitely a theme here, and I, I just absolutely love it because <laughs> okay, I'm not awesome. a perfect Asian American. <laughs> All right, we'll take a break. Welcome back. I'm here with uh, Jean Luen Yang, and we're talking about comics and science and technology. And I am super excited to have you here. We broke and we wanted to, uh, we started talking about this uh, Asian American identity and how that's really explored in these two um, graphic novels that you put together. Um, I want to talk about the first one, um, American Born Chinese. It's award winning. I know because of the sticker. <laughs> The sticker right here. And I consumed this in like an hour the other day. It took me five years to make, but that's cool. <laughs> if you want to read it in an hour, that's cool. Oh, God. Um, and I love this story. I mean, just to give you some background, my mom's from Taiwan. Okay. Um, she came in her like late 20s. And my dad is Mexican-American. And I grew up in a town, like I've mentioned, Linden, which is not culturally diverse, um, even compared to like this Bellingham. So were you the most diverse I was, thing in the town? We were the only Chinese American family, okay. and I'm not even full Chinese. Okay. So, um, and uh, and I could totally identify with this book. Like it was crazy, and um, how this character, you know, has this, you know, kid who comes and who has an accent. He's from Taiwan, you know, and he wants to be friends. Here, here's this one right here. He comes in, and he's just his initial instinct is just not be friends with this kid from Taiwan. And I like, I could totally identify with that, right? I don't even speak Chinese, right? And everyone mm -hmm. assume I did. And I would just be like, I need to distance myself from anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So where did this all come from? Is this personal or is this just like friends of yours? It's, th that's definitely a personal book. It's fiction, okay. but I, okay. I pulled heavily from my own life right. to, to, to make that book. Yeah. When I was in, I think when I was in fourth grade, uh, this kid came from Taiwan to our school and he was a third grader yeah. and our teachers were so insistent on us being friends yeah, uh, yeah and I, I just that. I just remember I, I didn't even have like a logical thought behind it I just remember being like repulsed exactly from the, from the depths of my heart I really just wanted to get away from this kid mm -hmm. you know he'd follow me around 
he, he didn't speak English very well, so he's following you around, speaking in Mandarin. Yeah. And do you know Mandarin? Did I do, okay. I do, but I wouldn't speak it. Yeah. Right? I, would, I definitely yeah. wouldn't speak it at, at school. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, my best friend and I, uh, we ended up like throwing tan bark at him to, to get him away from us. Right. Do you know what tan bark is? I don't know if they have it up here. It's, it's the stuff in the, it's in like the, in the playground. It's like little bits of, yeah, little bits of wood. Right, right, yeah. Which is really a cruel thing to do, it's right? Terrible. Throwing little bits of wood. Wait, so in, now when I think about what he must have gone through, right? That yeah. was his first week yeah. in America. You know, he must have been really happy to see this other Chinese kid at yeah. school, and this other Chinese kid ends the week by well, throwing bits of wood at him. I don't want to. I don't want to make myself out as a saint. I wasn't a total. I mean, I didn't totally turn around. I didn't know any Chinese. I refused to learn. Do you know um, any Chinese now? I took some here at Western okay, Washington University cool. in college, um, but I didn't want to learn Spanish because my I was half Mexican, and I was kind of ashamed to tell people that I was too. Mm. So I mean, like, there was a lot of self hate. Um, but I mean, there was some turnaround. It that's took a good. long time. That's it took good. like late twenties. I mean, 20s. I just think that's part of growing up, right? Yeah. Especially if if you grew up in a situation where you were part of a minority, right? Or you were the minority. Or you're the you, minority. You, just, you right? just go through, and and I don't even think you would be able to articulate the self hate when you're actually feeling it. Right. It's just you right. you you know that you're not part of the group. You right. know that you're different, and then yeah. you have to at some point um, become comfortable with that. You have to accept that. Which is the end of this book. Yeah, I guess so. I don't I mean, know spoilers, <laughs> but but that's basically. The I, end I of feel this like book. that, like yeah. making that book was part of my catharsis. It was part of my process of accepting. Right. And how old are you when you? I mean, if I can ask. I like finished. I finished that book when I was in my early thirties. Right. It's been a so long time. I, I think I think I came to that conclusion in my like late twenties, early thirties yeah. too. I I want to go back to maybe science and how like so when you're when you're in college and you're like. Were you still a graph? Oh, sorry, a computer scientist when you were writing this? Yeah, you know. So, um, so right after I graduated from college, I um, took a job as a computer programmer okay. for a couple of years, and then I left that job and I became a high school teacher. I taught computer okay. science. So I taught AP computer science. I taught introductory computer science. Okay. And did that for a really long time. So I was when I was working on that book, I was actually teaching computer science. So like, so when you're teaching computer science and you're thinking about like, I think where we grew up and stuff, I think a theme b with computer science and also with your, your graphic novels is this idea of the model minority, mm -hmm. you know, and this idea that, you know, ch Chinese or Asians, you know, really North Asians are really, really good at science and we're really smart and we're perfect and we're like, you know, we never get into trouble and like, did that? Did you see that at all when you were teaching or when you were going through school or when you were writing these books? I mean, I, as, a, as a student, I definitely felt that pressure. Yeah. And, and I think the, the whole my model minority, um, that, that whole myth of the model minority, yeah. really comes out of immigration patterns, right? Like yeah. my parents came over in the 70s around that time. Uh, if you were really good, if you were living in Asia and you were really good at math or science, you were encouraged to come to the United States. Right. So of course, if you get like all the kids that are yeah, that are good right? students in that it's one particular area, bias. you bring it over. It totally is a selection bias. Yeah, it yeah. totally is, right? Yeah. And and out of that came this 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 model minority thing. Right. I, I just don't I don't think that existed. If you if you go back to like the forties or thirties. Like the gold you look rush at, too. Yeah, and you look yeah. at you look at the, the, the Chinese communities that that were um, you know in San Francisco at the time. I don't think those same stereotypes existed for right. those communities. It's it's so strange because I mean we in Seattle have these histories of the international district and and like crime and all this stuff that happened and it's so crazy how quickly that was like kind of covered yeah, exactly. by like you know Microsoft and, and Google and and the and these selection bias that you have yeah. and it's so crazy to me and there's some I mean do do you know who Ronald Takaki is he was a no. uh, professor an Asian American studies professor at UC Berkeley okay so I was privileged enough, privileged enough to sit in on one of his lectures mm -hmm. he's the one that really examines this model minority yeah. you know thing and, and he talks about and when how, did it start like, yeah, when did it start and who's it for like a model for who you right. know and and his, right. what he what he argues is that really Asian Americans in a lot of ways are being used um, by American society almost against other minority groups. It is. It's a know? divide and conquer thing. I mean, It kind of is, yeah. I mean, like I said, I'm being part of two minorities, you know, Hispanic and Asian, you kind of see this dynamic happen and yeah. you see um, a lot of stuff in, in STEM, we're trying to get more underrepresented minorities, but Asians don't in, aren't included in that. Yeah. But you have to be careful because what about people from Laos? What about exactly. people from Cambodia who have, 
you know, also yeah. huge struggle and not the same statistics of success yeah. as like Chinese or Americans. Even, or even other parts of China. Right, right? exactly right. Or like, like the Uyghur um, yeah. regions, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really interesting. But what, I, what we were talking about in the break is that I really, really love how your character isn't perfect. Like, like we said, we had this self-hate. We did these terrible things, right? Uh -huh. and, and the same with the shadow hero. Her, his uh, mother is, is not perfect, but she's still lovable. You know? And I want to live in a world where we can be people of color and not be perfect, right? Yeah. It's really hard or, in media. Or, or I, I think it's more just to be three-dimensional, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, I think when I was growing up, at least, it was very difficult to find three-dimensional characters, three-dimensional Asian-American characters right. in any of the stories that I read or any of the stories that I watched right. on television. Right. Uh, G.I. Joe might have been the one exception. There were a couple <laughs> right. of G.I. Joe characters, both on the good guy side and the bad guy right. side, who were three-dimensional. And the reason yeah. why was because most of those episodes were written by this Japanese-American writer. So he was very right. cognizant of this, this guy named wow. Larry Hama. Cool. Yeah, you should check him out. He's awesome. I should, I should know more. <laughs> but we were talking about complex characters in the DC universe, so we can get to your Superman writing. Uh -huh. I think Superman is more complex than people give him credit for. And Harley, we were talking about like Batman villains. There's a lot of villains in the Batman universe that are very, they're straddling, right? I mean, Catwoman yeah. is very much yeah. not good, but not all bad. Yeah. And, and it's great to actually have these complex characters. So tell me more about Superman and how you write him. And how is he different from like the movies and like the old trope? I, I think um, I think uh, the the superhero genre has a lot of overlap with the immigrant experience. You know, yeah, uh, the definitely. the creators of Superman and Batman too. Yeah, and and pretty much every other superhero and he, out he's there. He's an international immigrant. Yeah, it, I mean they were, they were children of immigrants. They were yeah. these these children of these poor Jewish immigrants from right. Europe. Right. Uh, and uh, and I think they really embedded a lot of their experience into this character. They so did. This, whole idea of having to negotiate two different identities and two different names, two different sets of expectations. Mm -hmm. That's just something that the, the kids of immigrants have to deal with on a daily basis. Right. right. So when I grew up, I had one name at home and another one at school, right. spoke one language at home and another one at school, right. had two different sets of expectations. Um, and, and unconsciously or not, I think that's um, part of the reason why I was drawn to superheroes as a kid, right. is that I saw that same dual identity play out in these in these comics right you know? well in that that it, they were saying that these dual identities are okay and even necessary yeah like yeah. i was like oh that they're it's good okay for the world, right? yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um no i i loved that no but so how how are you writing superman then how is your the way you write him like similar to the old ones or maybe more like the uncle like how are you writing him? well um first I, i'm working as part of a team okay. so superman is popular enough now that he's in four different books so okay. there's Superman, which I write. There's Action Comics. This, this is this Superman right here. Yeah, that's the one I write. First and then one. there's Action Comics. There's uh, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman, Superman. Okay. So we all have to kind of coordinate. I'll tell you what draws me to the character, though, is yeah. those immigrant roots. Yeah. You know? and, um, and, uh, and, and this idea of the dual identity. What we wanted to do, so something that, that kids of immigrants have to do as they get older is they, they have to take these two different identities that they lived in all, for all their childhoods, and they have to kind of collapse them into one, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what we force Superman to, to do as well. In the first storyline, um, this, uh, this villain, this new villain, who's kind of like an evil version of Facebook, and we can debate, yes, yeah. we can debate whether you need an evil version of Facebook or I was not. wondering who was on his phone. Some, somebody's, <laughs> somebody's talking to Superman. I'm like, I don't know who that's this person right. is. That's right. So he's like an evil version of Facebook. He, he leads to Superman's secret identity being exposed. So he right. has to, he's forced to integrate. He's forced to integrate these two identities. So th this Superman that you're writing, everyone knows he's Clark Kent? Everyone knows he's Clark Kent. Wow. By issue number 44, everyone knows. Wow, and you're 41. So this is like three, three issues in. Three boom. issues in, and he gets wow. revealed. i got to yeah. actually read the rest. I yeah. got this and then, free, and then so. after he gets revealed, <laughs> this, this took a little, little uh, arguing on my part, but uh, we bring him to Oakland, California. Oh, yes. <laughs> Because that's, that's what awesome. you do, right? Right. When things go bad, you go to Oakland. You go to, I hear Oakland's getting really nice, though. Oakland is getting it's really nice. It's gentrifying. Yeah, that's yeah. What I hear. yeah. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, I want to talk about your new appointment, how we're going to integrate all the stuff, this cool stuff we've been talking about, and actually get people interested in STEM. Awesome. Awesome. Welcome back. We're talking with graphic novelist Jean Luen Yang. 
and we're talking about comics a lot, and I swear <laughs> we're going to talk about science again. Um, I want to bring it to scientists in comics. So we had this big event here at Western where we talked about science and pop culture and who's being portrayed as the scientists in pop culture. Mm -hmm. And I dressed up as Dr. Light, and we had this big Which event. Which is awesome. Yeah, thank you. Which is perfect. Right, because I, I um, used to dress up like Harley, but it just became too popular, so I Googled, okay. I Googled like Asian astrophysics, and then she came up. Yep. <laughs> I think she would be the only one to come up, right? Yes, yeah, she was the Did only. anyone else come up? No. Okay. <laughs> no. In, in, in comics, no. Okay. And I was like, that's just me. I can just slightly be me and yeah. be a comic book. Um, I'd be a superhero. But I wanted to say, like, there are a lot of science in comics. I mean, like, that's how people get superhero uh, yeah. superpowers. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they're sometimes called science heroes. Superheroes are called science heroes, right? Really? Because I there is this science fiction element to a lot of origin stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, not Batman, but, but pretty he, much everybody but else. He, he, I mean, I would say that he's kind of he's I guess technology. so. He's an engineer. Yeah, he's yeah, an engineer. Yeah, he's an engineer. Yeah, right? You're, right. Um, you're right. So Batman's an engineer. Um, or at least he hires engineers. He's like a Steve Jobs. He hires the he right. hires Lucius Fox. Right, but it, it depends on who. And yells at him yeah. to, to make awesome technology. If you look at the animated series, he's doing a lot of that engineering. Yeah, himself, that's true. Right, that's true. But he does hire Lucius Fox, another person of color in science. That's right. Um, but uh, Superman is a journalist. Um, Batman's a, the greatest detective. Mm -hmm. These are people that ask questions, which is basically what scientists do. So you have this science. Is that the what you want to kind of project and kind of promote with your new position. So let's talk about your like sure. your goals. I have them written down here, so yeah. I'll check if so you're, as, you're right. So as national ambassador, every <laughs> national ambassador comes up with a platform, which is just something that they want to talk about during their term. Yeah. For me, uh, it's reading without walls. And that's just a fancy way of saying I want to get kids to explore the world through reading. I, I think uh, exploration is such an important part of growing up, and books are such a great way of exploring the world. So I'm encouraging kids to do three things to explore the world. Number yep. one is I have them here. Um, to read books about people who are different from them, so yeah. people who look different from them or, or live differently from them. Second is to read books about topics that they might find intimidating. And my pet project here is STEM books, books right. about science, technology, engineering, and math. Right. And then finally, it's to uh, read books in different formats. Uh, when I was a kid, I had this friend who was a huge science fiction geek, and he totally looked his lo looked down his nose at comics, right? He just would yeah. never touch a graphic novel in his life. Yeah. So to a kid like that, I would want him to try a graphic novel. Right. But now I meet kids that are the exact opposite, right. that only read graphic novels. And to those kids, I really want them to, to explore some prose or some you know, books in verse or something. Right. Well, I, I think, I mean, there's even ways that you can even trick them. This is, sounds weird, but you can even trick them. I, I think, like, for instance, I am a giant Avatar The Last Airbender fan. I mean, like, when it came out, I was in grad school, and I love this comic, and it's very mystical, and there's a lot of magic in it. Yeah. But there's, like, hidden inside the story, and you're actually the writer for the comic, right? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Which I think you're, like, the coolest now. Um, <laughs> Hidden in there is Sokka, this character right here. I don't know if you can see that. Um, he doesn't have any powers. He doesn't have any bending. Uh -huh. He doesn't have any magic. And he's an engineer. He is. He totally is. He draws designs <laughs> he draws of design. machines. Right. And he gets them made. Right. Yeah, he's right. awesome. And, and, um, and he talks about science a he lot does. in he the series. He talks about science a lot. Yeah. And yeah. I, I feel like there, there are ways you can just kind of, I don't know. I don't want to I mean, say trick, I, yeah. but insert yeah, I mean, I these think, things. I think there's, there's something about, like, the stories we tell uh, color certain professions, right? And, right? and I think that one of the things that we're seeing now is that scientists and, and nerds and, and people, and like yeah. geeks, are yeah. kind of emerging as a cool class. We are cool. And the reason why that's happening, in part, is because they're showing up as heroes in the stories that, that right. we read. Right, right. Yeah. Like, I mean, you, you can be a nerd and you don't have to look like you know exactly. the, the the NASA engineers from 1950. Yeah, like or you can, like or like 20 year old Bill Gates. You don't have to look like that. Right? Exactly. <laughs> you can look like me. You can look yeah. like Barry Allen. You yeah, can look exactly. like Cisco. Um, but you also do this um, comic called Secret Coders. Can mm -hmm. you tell us about that? Secret Coders is a is a series of graphic. It's a graphic novel series. Mm -hmm. There will be six books in all, and I'm super excited about this book. Yeah, I went to your uh, website. It's, so it's graphic. Sorry, secret coders.com. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a book that I've thought about for a really long time. It's a book that teaches kids um, 
the fundamentals of computer science yeah. through Logo, through that language that we talked about earlier. Awesome. You just uh, dug it up from the grave and like yeah, resurrected yeah. it. Well, well, there's a reason why I wanted to do Logo. Okay. And it's because I wanted to draw the parallel between coding and magic. Mm, okay. So in magic, like in Harry Potter, usually you, know, you speak these words that sound like they're out of some dead language, and then something magic happens, something amazing happens. It's called right? Latin. And, and I, think, I think code... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's called Latin. <laughs> and I think coding is the same way. Yeah, you know, yeah. you speak these, these words that seem kind of weird, yeah. and then something amazing happens, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. So I wanted, I wanted that parallel, and I thought the way, a way, one way to draw that parallel was to use uh, a language that's kind of dead, that's on the dead side. Right, like and kind logo. of mystical. And a little bit mystical, yeah, oh, yeah. I love it. And, and these kids in this, in this new series go to a school, and they're, they're solving mysteries. Yeah, I, so it is kind of mystical and magic. Yeah, well, I, I only handle the writing. The, the drawing is handled by this guy named Mike Holmes, who's okay. amazingly talented. He used to work on the Adventure Time comic before okay, he started working yes. with me. Okay, yes, which is very popular here on campus. And, and what we're doing uh, in the book is I want to structure every chapter to kind of be like one of my lessons. You okay. know, the, the, I started thinking about this book when I was teaching computer science, and I used to teach in this really visual way. I ended up drawing a lot on the board. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, man, a lot of these lessons would really work well as comics. Mm -hmm. So each of these chapters, it starts off with a little bit of review of an old concept. Then I introduce something new, and then I give them an exercise to solve on their own. So that's how I ran my lectures, right? I would do a little bit of review, I'd introduce a new concept, right. I'd end the lecture with something that they would work on on their own to see if they understood the concept. So do you still teach a little bit or is, are you kind of teaching through this comic right now? Well, I, right now for STEM at least, I, I'm only teaching through the comic. Right. I am still teaching creative writing. I teach okay. through uh, the MFA program at Hamlin University. It's an yeah. online program, so I do okay. it from home. Okay, so you, do, you, do you ever throw in a little bit of computer science just to like t to well, challenge them? I think that there's a lot of overlap yeah. between computer science and telling stories. Well, you in know, creative writing, yeah. you have to be creative to write a really <coughs> nice program. My cro programs in computer science were awful, so they were, I, they were long. I bet they were kind of awesome. No, I bet they were no, kind of awesome. they weren't. But, it, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same kind. Like, when, you, when you're working on a comic, what you have to do is you have to take a story that's that's generally kind of vague in your head, right? It starts right. off as kind of vague in your head. It's kind of big and sprawling. Yeah. And you have to break it up into these discrete components. Yeah. Like first into chapters and then into panels. Right. And in right. computer science, it's the same, it's the same skill, thing. right? You take a, a, an idea that's kind of vague and you break it into modules. Exactly. And then those modules into lines of code. Wow. No, I love this. I love this. So um, I really hope this takes off. I'm actually going to read this with my daughter because I would love for her to understand this. That'd and I would actually love to learn how to code. So what's then next for this ambassadorship? What's the, so this, it just started. So what's your plan like after the ambassadorship? What do you want to do? Do you want to still do STEM stuff or are you going to kind of go off into? Well, I have, uh, so we, we just finished uh, writing and drawing the third volume of Secret Coders. We have three more of those to do. Okay. Uh, I'm also working on the next book that I'm both writing and drawing, okay. and that'll be my first nonfiction book. It's about basketball. Awesome. I, I followed a high school basketball team for a season. And really? I'm doing a book about them. That's yeah. awesome. I, we, we have to wrap up. This has been like an awesome conversation. Hopefully we can maybe continue it offline and nobody gets to see it. Um, <laughs> but um, I do want to thank you for coming, and I think you're doing wonderful work. Thank you. Thank like, you, Regina. This yeah. was fun. It was yeah, great. I think so, too. This is our first time. Um, you know, watchers and listeners, you can tell us how this turned out. And if it was a disaster, let me know because I need those negative thoughts. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I think it went great. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. And uh, I'm going to shake your hand like an adult. Awesome. Okay. <laughs>